Hello, this is Paul Watkins from the Kennedy Krieger Institute and Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. And this is Phytanic Acid 101. So in this brief talk, we're going to discuss what phytanic acid is, where it comes from, and how we think it causes problems in adult Refsum disease. Phytanic acid is a chemical compound, so we need to review a little bit of chemistry. Living things are composed of several chemical building blocks called elements. The most abundant elements in nature are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And also important for living things are nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus. These elements are shown with their chemical symbol, C for carbon, H for hydrogen, O for oxygen, and so on. Now, elements can link together by forming chemical bonds. Substances containing elements linked together by chemical bonds are called compounds. And when we make compounds, there are certain rules that must be followed. Carbon can bond to four other elements, whereas hydrogen can only make one bond, <clears throat> oxygen can make two bonds, and nitrogen can make three bonds. Some very common examples which you're all familiar with are, for example, water. Water we know is H2O. And if we draw out the bonding structure of water, it's HOH, where we see that hydrogen is making one bond and oxygen is making two bonds. Another common example is ammonia, which is NH3. Ammonia, which we said can make three bonds, is bonded to three hydrogen atoms in ammonia. And again, hydrogen is only making one bond. Another common example is oxygen, which we all know is O2. And it turns out that oxygen makes two bonds between the two atoms of oxygen. And this is a double bond, which is a stronger bond. Methane, which is a natural gas, its chemical formula is CH4. And the carbon, a single carbon atom is bonded to four different hydrogen atoms. Again, following the rules where carbon can make four bonds, hydrogen only one. Remember this for later on in the talk. Phytanic acid is also a chemical compound and it's composed only of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Phytanic acid is a member of a large family of compounds which we call fatty acids. So we're gonna talk about the fatty part of a fatty acid and then the acid part of a fatty acid separately. So chains of hydrogen and carbon, carbon and hydrogen form the fatty part of a fatty acid. As you can see in this illustration, a straight chain of carbon atoms linked together with hydrogen atoms surrounding them form the fatty part of a fatty acid. Fatty acids can have chain lengths of carbon atoms that range from the short to the very long, as listed here. Now the acid part of a fatty acid looks like this. We call it COOH, but it structurally looks like a carbon making a double bond to this oxygen, making a single bond to this oxygen, and the oxygen making a single bond to a hydrogen atom. And this fourth bond on the acid part attaches to the last carbon on the fatty part to form a fatty acid. So notice while, note, note while this carbon is bonded to the oxygen on the right by a single bond, it's bonded to the one above it by a double bond. So if we put these two together, the fatty part and the acid part, we have a fatty acid. If someone uses the term fatty acid, typically they're referring to a long chain fatty acid and most commonly having 16 to 18 carbon atoms in the chain. These are the most abundant in nature. Because the carbons are all in a row, we call this a straight chain fatty acid. The example here is found, has 16 carbon atoms in its chain, and it's found to be very abundant in palm oil, hence its trivial name called palmitic acid. Now it's very cumbersome to write this whole structure out like 
he, this example. So we use a shorthand <clears throat> and that's shown here. In this shorthand, we're leaving the acid function as COOH, but the fatty part is written by a squiggly line, but each, at the point of each squiggle means a carbon atom. So here's carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So this has the same number of carbon atoms as this, but it's much easier to write. So we'll use this shorthand uh, in our later uh, illustrations. We can also have branched chain fatty acids in addition to straight chain fatty acids. These branches are little side chains, which you show here that are usually composed of one carbon atom and three hydrogen atoms. If you recall, methane had a carbon atom surrounded by four carbon atoms. So these branches are called methyl branches because they are related to methane. Phytanic acid has four such methyl branches on the third, uh, three, seven, 11, and 15th carbon atom in, this, in the chain. So here's 16 carbon atoms in a row like palmitic acid at, but we have these four methyl branches. And that's what phytanic acid looks like. If you use the shorthand notation, we put the methyl branches like this, again, on the third, seventh, 11th, and 15th carbon atom. So this is phytanic acid. So what do we do with fatty acids? There are many things, fatty acids are very versatile chemical compounds and we can use them for many purposes. But the most common purposes are to burn them for energy, to store them as fat, or to use them as building blocks to make more complicated molecules, which we call complex lipids. And in general, the body treats phytanic acid just like the other fatty acids. Let's look at these in more detail. When we say we burn fatty acids for energy, what we mean is that we break them down to produce ATP. ATP is the molecule that drives muscle contraction, heartbeat, brain function, lung function, breathing, kidney function, keeping us at 98.6 degrees, all the bodily processes that you can think of require energy and that energy comes from ATP and that ATP can be among other places derived from the breakdown of fatty acids. And the process of fatty acid breakdown to produce energy is called beta oxidation. Now you don't have to know what that means at this point, but it's just the term for the breakdown of a straight chain fatty acid into smaller molecules, smaller two carbon fragments and the release of lots of ATP, which can be used to drive many biological processes. So in the process of beta oxidation, enzymes will break the bond at, between every two carbons, releasing small two carbon fragments, breaking down the fatty acid, releasing lots of energy. Another thing that we always do with fatty acids is store them as fat. It's either the fat on us, the fat on a piece of meat, or stored fatty acids, which we store in the form of triglycerides. As the name suggests, tri means three. So Triglycerides are made up of three fatty acids, as you can see here, one, two, three fatty acids hooked to a backbone of a small molecule with three carbons called glycerol. So triglycerides are the molecules that look like this and are the main constituent of the fat on us or a piece of meat or any other fat. Other things we can do with fatty acids are use them to make more complex compounds called complex lipids. And some examples on this in the next slide are phospholipids, 
phospholipids are the molecules that make up the membranes that surround all our cells and tissues. In this example, we take a blow up of a piece of a cell membrane and represent in this cartoon form. You can see that there are several molecules that have these little squiggles, where each squiggle represents a fatty acid. So each molecule of a phospholipid has what we call a head group. And as the name phospho suggests, there's some phosphorus in there. But the important thing in this context is there are, for every phospholipid molecule, there are two fatty acid molecules that are components of that phospholipid. So as you can imagine, to make the membrane surrounding only one cell would require tens of thousands of phospholipid molecules, tens of thousands of fatty acid molecules that make up the phospholipid. So very important structural components. In addition, in the nervous system, there are even more complex, complex lipids than phospholipids. And these are called sphingolipids or glycolipids, and there are several other uh, species of, of complex lipids. And these are very important for normal nervous system function. They're found in the membranes of a lot of the cells in the nervous system, the neurons and oligodendrocytes. Neurons generate the electrical signals which propagate through axons or the wire of a, of a nerve, nerve cell. And those send the signal to other neurons by connecting to them and the signal gets propagated down their axon and so forth. Oligodendrocytes make a substance called myelin, which wraps around the axons, wraps around the wire, creating an insulator. So oligodendrocytes insulating the, the axons of neurons are extremely important for normal conduction of neurologic signals. And in diseases in which the myelin doesn't form properly or is defective in any way, causes leukodystrophy, white matter brain diseases. So fatty acids are very important constituents of these sphingolipids and glycolipids. And if they are dysfunctional, can disrupt the myelin and disrupt the conduct, normal conduction of electricity down the axon. So what's different in Refsum disease? So phytanic acid is toxic if it'll, it is allowed to accumulate in the body. Detoxification requires control of the levels of phytanic acid and requires breakdown mainly via the fuel burning pathway that we mentioned earlier. People who do not have Refsum disease can break down phytanic acid to prevent its buildup and thus prevent toxicity. But in Refsum disease, there's reduced ability to degrade phytanic acid. So it can accumulate in your triglycerides, your phospholipids, sphingolipids, and all other complex lipids causing problems. The accumulation of toxic phytanic acid is thought to be the cause of most of the symptoms affecting individuals with, with Refsum disease. The peripheral nerve issues, the cerebellar balance issues, the retinitis pigmentosa, the hearing issues, and so forth, are all thought to be caused by accumulation of phytanic acid in particularly the nervous system. So it turns out that degradation of branch chain fatty acids like phytanic acid is a bit more complicated than degradation, degradation of the straight chain fatty acids. The problem is the methyl branch on phytanic acid that's closest to the COOH end of phytanic acid. So this guy here is a problem. And I won't go into the details of why this is a problem, but it comes back to the chemistry and the rule that you can only make four bonds to a carbon atom. It turns out that while when fatty acids are broken down, if it has this methyl group that tries to place five bonds on a carbon atom, which is not allowed, and thus the enzymes don't work. So 
the enzymes that break down straight chain fatty acids can't deal with this particular extra branch. So a specialized additional set of enzymes called alpha oxidation enzymes remove one carbon atom, the one in the COOH, from the phytanic acid molecule and it comes off as carbon di dioxide. And that literally shifts the position of this branch from being instead of one, two, three to one, two. And because of this shift, the beta oxidation enzymes, the ones that break down straight chain fatty acids can actually break down the entire rest of the phytanic acid molecule, generating pieces that have either three carbons, two carbons, or in this case at the end, four carbons, all of which the body can deal with processing further. But in addition, you again get lots of ATP. So to break down phytanic acid, we need both the alpha oxidation enzymes and the beta oxidation enzymes. In Refsum disease, it turns out that one of the alpha oxidation enzymes does not work properly. And if it does not work properly, you can't knock off this first carbon, this COOH carbon, and shift the position of the methyl branch. The rest of the molecule cannot be broken down, and this builds up and becomes toxic. Now, where does phytanic acid come from? It comes from this side chain called phytol of the chlorophyll molecule. And chlorophyll, most of us know, is the substance that gives the green color to plants. Chlorophyll, chlorophyll is a very complicated molecule containing uh, this uh, complex ring structure at this end. And this actually is what gives the chlorophyll molecule its green color. But it has this side chain called phytol, which you can see at a glance, looks very much like phytanic acid. Humans cannot release this phytol from chlorophyll, but bacteria in the rumen compartment of the stomach of cows, sheep, and other rumen animals can do this. The cow's digestive system is very complicated in, with respect to our own digestive system and has evolved for the, the uh, digestion of uh, things like plants. As you can see, this cow cartoon is the cartoon cow is eating grass, and the new, the chewed up grass traveled down this green pipeline to this first compartment of the cow's stomach called the rumen. And in this, this is where bacteria come and break the phytol side chain off of the chlorophyll molecule, and then it goes through the second, third, and fourth compartments of the stomach, and then to the intestines. So after the rumen bacteria released the phytol from the, from the chlorophyll, the animals then, can then convert the released phytol into phytanic acid, where it gets stored in their fat or triglycerides and their complex lipids. It turns out that in addition to, to animals like cows, fish can also accumulate phytanic acid derived from the chlorophyll that is in the plankton that they eat. And then when we consume foods containing phytanic acid, like uh, beef products, milk, and certain fish, this can lead to increased levels of this toxic fatty acid in people who cannot degrade it efficiently. So in summary, phytanic acid is a fatty acid that is ingested in the foods that we eat. Phytanic acid differs from the more abundant straight chain fatty acids by having these little methyl branches. But because of the branches, degradation of phytanic acid requires specialized enzymes. Reduced ability to degrade phytanic acid in Refsum disease is due to impairment of these enzymes and promotes the accumulation of phytanic acid into fat and other complex lipids. And subsequently, this accumulation is thought to be toxic when levels get too high, causing problems in the nervous system and other organs. So thank you very much for listening to this brief presentation. If you have questions, please feel free to email me at the address shown below. Thank you.